Well, hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan Tepperman. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Foreign Policy. Welcome to this session on Russia's strategic outline, uh, out, outlook. Excuse me. This was uh, always going to be a very interesting conversation, um, but the changes that President Putin recently proposed to Russia's conversation and the government shakeup have guaranteed that this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Um, I know you're not here to hear me talk, so let me quickly introduce the panelists, uh, and then we'll dive right into the conversation. We're very lucky to have with us today, to my immediate left, Maxim Oreshkin, who until the recent shakeup was Russia's Minister of Economic Development and will be back very soon in some yet unnamed capacity. <laughs> Stay tuned. Um, to his left, your right. You know more than me. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. Um, we have have Maros Sefcovic, uh, the European Commission's Vice President for Interinstitutional Relations and Foresight, uh, a man with great foresight. Um, <laughs> next, we have Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, a senior fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and a former U.S. Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs, among many other things. Um, and to her left, finally, uh, last but not least, we have... Um, uh, Excuse me, uh, Kirill uh, Dmitriev, who is the uh, CEO, the head of Russia's Sovereign Wealth Fund, the Direct Investment Fund. Uh, Minister, um, I'm still going to call you Minister, let me start with you. I'm hoping uh, that because you're temporarily out of office, you're going to speak with utter and undiplomatic candor here today. Because uh, no one is watching, so you feel free. Um, President Putin has managed to confuse virtually every analyst outside of Russia, at least, with the recent revisions to Russia's government structure. Um, but many analysts, at least in the West, have interpreted it as a way to allow Putin to keep control over Russia when he finishes his final presidential term in, in 2024. Is that accurate, or did the president have other objectives, and why then did your government immediately resign? Oh, you'd better ask the president when you will meet him next time. I look forward to it, but in the meantime, you're the best we have. Well, the, the only comment that I will give you is that uh, when there were shifts towards more presidential power, there were, uh, you know, comments that he strengthened his power. Then, when there is the move towards less presidential power, we have the same comments. So maybe something wrong with comments. Ambassador Dobriansky, how do things look to you? Well, uh, in 2024, uh, when President Putin's term is up, he'll be 72 years old. And I think this announcement correlates with his thinking ahead. Uh, if you may recall, at the time when he was president, and then at the time where uh, Article uh, 81 of the Russian Constitution calls for you can only have two consecutive terms as president, that at the time, remember, uh, Medvedev then moved and they did a switch. So in this case, by setting up this state council, actually, and weakening the presidency, I think the expectation uh, is that Putin most likely will become the chairman of the state council. It's the Security Council, right? Uh, uh, in this case, uh, 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 it is the essentially the term is also state council that's used. It's interesting you said Security Council, because if I could give a model, in Kazakhstan, when Nazarbayev stepped down, actually he became chair of the Security Council. And so he relinquished the presidency. But in terms of the power base and what drives the political direction of Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev is still very much in charge. I think we will see that kind of model in the case of Russia. Mr. Dmitriev, uh, Russia's new prime minister, Mikhail uh, uh, Mishustin, has a reputation as a very competent reformer. Um, of course, his predecessor, Dmitry Medvedev, when he became prime minister, also had a reputation as a very promising reformer. Uh, and we all know how that turned out. People are now very unhappy with his failure to revive Russia's economy and push through the deep structural reforms that the country needs. Um, are you any more optimistic about his successor, and what do you think his top priorities should be? 
Okay, well, uh, first of all, I'll quickly touch on the constitutional aspect, and I think it's about checks and balances, and frankly should be applauded by the West, because introducing checks and balances between different branches of power is a good thing, and I think this is what constitutional changes are about. And talking about Prime Minister, Mr. Mishustin, uh, everybody, including the most, I would say, radical liberal people, uh, uh, recognize him as a very efficient, very forward-looking, very results-oriented person. He came, he actually used to be an investor at some point, a successful investor. Then he had the Russian tax service and did lots of great reforms there, uh, very technological, very innovative. So we believe, whereas the previous government actually did a very good job on macroeconomic stability, because we have low inflation, low debt, it's basically created a foundation for the growth that the new government can uh, bring forward. And I think investments... Um, and efficiency are going to be the hallmark of the new government. And I'll use an opportunity to actually announce two things that, for example, we are doing to increase investments uh, in Russia's RDIF. So uh, this is the first time we're announcing that uh, it has been agreed, and we worked on this with Mr. Areshkin, who has been very helpful to drive this agenda forward, that RDIF will be able... Just explain what that is for people who don't know that. Yes, yeah, so we as Sovereign Wealth Fund of Russia, we've been investing with top investors all over the world, with China's Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, UAE, and Saudi Arabia. And for the first time, we're announcing that now we will be able to invest not only with foreign co-investors, but also only with Russian co-investors. And that's a big change to the model of the fund, and it's based on the fact that we had a very good track record, uh, and we showed that we can really bring lots of investments, and we will be bringing lots of Russian investments uh, in as well. And a second announcement we'll be making that jointly with Ministry of Finance, we will create an infrastructure fund that will fund up to 20% of new projects in Russia, and then government will get its money back through taxes, and it will be up to $600 billion, and again, very much targeted to increase investments in Russia. So we believe the new government will focus on increasing investments, on increasing efficiency, and frankly, it brings a very important dimension to Russia, because last year was a year of huge geopolitical successes. Russia is stronger in the Middle East. Russia is stronger in relationship with Europe. We're actually hopeful to improve the relationship with the U.S., but all of it is dependent on strong economy growth, and we believe the new government is about that. Uh, Minister, please, yeah. I was going to ask you um, whether you have the same uh, sense and whether yeah. you would list the same priorities. I will uh, elaborate on what uh, Kirill have just said. Because if you look at the past, if you look at the past five years, for example, year 2014, the dependence of Russia on oil was much higher than we have these days. With oil price at above $110 per barrel, there was fiscal deficit. Inflation was high single digits, so it was high. Since then, Russia went through a deep structural reforms on the fiscal side on the macroeconomic policy side. And in this five-time span, which is pretty short, uh, comparing with what has happened with the macroeconomic fundamentals, we are having oil price at only 50 that is needed. We have low and stable inflation. And uh, what, has, what was started already in the past year, a lot of reforms on the micro level, including regulatory guillotine and other reforms which, we, which are improving business and investment climate. So in the past five years, huge changes happened. And it's definitely, like Kirill have just said, that laid foundation for further uh, movement. So what is happening these days? It's a big shift from agenda of consolidation, which was definitely needed and will be definitely helping going forward towards the agenda of development. So at what price, by the way, does the government uh, uh, set its budgets on oil? It's uh, below 45. As of now. Below 45. Uh, how much... And having below 45 oil price in, in the budget, last year we had 1.8% fiscal surplus. So we had fiscal deficit mm -hmm. with 110, and now with 60. Last year we have 1.8 fiscal surplus. So it's a big change. And if you look at other countries which going through such adjustment... It's, it's uh, typically much worse uh, in terms of economic performance, in terms of income dynamics. And if you look at, for example, in the past three years, you'll find that uh, GDP per employee in Russia grew by 7%, world average 7.9. So despite all this adjustment, 
and recovery, which is going, still going on in the world economy, the growth rates were pretty close. Of course, this is definitely enough. That is why the reshuffling is happening. That is why new agenda of development is on the stage. Right. I mean, you're painting a very rosy picture of the economy, but the it's reshuffle not, it's, it's not suggests rosy. that the president wasn't so happy with the state of things. It's not rosy at all. It's a very good foundation, but the pace of progress, the pace of growth is definitely not enough, and especially in the household income level. So that is why this reshuffling is happening to bring new agenda, agenda of development instead of agenda of consolidation. Neither you um, uh, nor Mr. Dmitriev have, have mentioned tackling corruption, which seems like it has to be a big priority. Is that going to happen, and how is that going to happen? Well, I can tell you only about me, uh, what I did in the past three years within the ministry. There were some problems. There is no problems anymore. So, for example, in my ministry, everything is clear. So I'm with, uh, you know, uh, uh, very positively looking at the transferring the ministry to a new minister in a, of a ministry in a good shape. Uh, Mr. Sefcovich, I'm going to get to you in just a second. Don't please feel neglected, please. Um, Ambassador Dobryansky, I want to ask, get your take on this. Thank you. I, I uh, appreciate having a chance to address the strategic outlook in the economic context. President Putin had set a target of 3% economic uh, growth. That 3% has not been met. And let me tell you some of the reasons that are cited, not by me, but I'm going to cite a number of Russian economists and also think tank, think tankers. Um, uh, the fact is that there has been a lack of modernization. Uh, also, uh, the kind of restructuring of the economy that could really benefit the economy has not uh, unfolded. Um, Kudrin, who was the former finance minister, has referred to the fact that there has been a minimal investment in human capital, in particular here uh, because of his current position as accounts manager and looking at the budget. The budget over the last five years has not been placed into education and looking at the next generation. And that also correlates with the question of, of youth unemployment. Interestingly enough, the Las Vada Center came out with saying that 53 percent of those between the ages of 18 and 24 um, had indicated that they're looking at leaving the country um, because they're not looking for the uh, kinds of opportunities that they're hoping for and would like to, uh, to get in this case. And let me just add, finally, here I think it's also interesting. Uh, there was last year a study done by IMEMO. This is uh, Primakov's Institute of World Economy and International Relations. And it's basically tried to give a kind of a forecast going forward for Russia. And in it, it talked about one of the greatest priorities, which is to maintain Russia's international standing, how crucial it is, and that it's not only about politics, uh, but it is also about the economy. It actually called for in the report what constitutes in the term that was used was radical changes. Not per se economic reforms, but radical changes. Um, it also called for uh, not uh, maintaining only the relationship with China, interestingly enough, that the relationship, as you said, with the West is absolutely crucial because of economic development and advancement, that that will actually grow uh, Russia's economy more and, and, and provide greater opportunities. And then finally, it's, 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 it's worth noting that it also highlighted the issue of, if you will, modernization. And this was something also that was brought to the foreground by Anders Aslan. For those of you who know that name, he's a Swedish a former um, uh, foreign service officer who's an economist and wrote a book on a crony capitalism, in which, ironically, what he uh, forecasts for Russia was very comparable to the IMIMO um, uh, forecast. May I ask you a question? Please. When it was the last time when you were in Russia? The last time I was in Russia was not so recent. But you know, as I said, I'm not an economist. And I'm actually citing those who are in Russia and who, and I did that intentionally, and those who actually follow economic trends. I'm known not as an economist. I'm known more as a political scientist. So to me, because what's significant, if I could just say, is the diversity of viewpoints here. And 
I'm not going to say that some of the data that you provided, there have been areas where there have been some progress. But my point is trying to balance this conversation, that it's not rosy, as our moderator said, that there are some serious issues that haven't been tackled. Maybe this will provide an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I was very struck by Imemo's report, which was very much examined uh, by many political scientists in terms of what it put forward. Because you know that when you're studying the subject based only on the memos, you can easily get into a trap. So I simply invite you to come to Russia. It may be not only Moscow, St. Petersburg, any other city you'd like to. Walk the streets, talk to people, mm -hmm. and that will dramatically change your view. Because I don't, I don't when know you're that it will. Only, because, <laughs> because, you know, we'll invite you. We'll host you. Because <laughs> RDF will host you. <laughs> because you know that uh, you can, you know, after that you can start uh, thinking about the United States only through the Twitter. And it will be different from the reality, right? So, you know, coming to a country, looking into the faces of people, give, talking to them. I'll give just a 30-second footnote, Jonathan, sure. if I may. Uh, I always think it's important to travel to a country, but I also think it's important to speak to a wide variety of individuals. And I have met with Definitely. many Russians. You don't have to go to Russia just to meet with Russians. Well, most of the Russians and, are in, in Russia, you know. In, you know this, in, this case, <laughs> in this case, as I mentioned, the youth unemployment issue, your next generation, because, I'd because, say, you know, is really but, but, questioning. You have pensioners who are also protesting the economic reforms. Mr. Arashkin, your, your point is very well taken. Uh, to Paula's, uh, Ambassador Dobransky's credit, um, she is an expert on Russia. Um, it's also worth remembering that um, a, Russia is not exactly an easy climate today in which to go and canvas people's opinions. Um, and it's the, 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 we don't exactly... You should also visit Russia. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, you, you can take the position that these are all Western lies um, and we have nothing to agree on. Um, but but, you know, then we, we will agree we to can, disagree. You know, but I don't think that we, that's what we should spend this, this session it's, debating. It's, it's very important because, you know, it's uh, definitely, uh, me personally, mm -hmm. I welcome different opinions. Mm -hmm. And I like listening to different opinions. But, you know, when I hear things which are not based on the real facts, but only on someone telling somebody something, mm -hmm. that is not a high quality of analysis. I do enough, follow, but, but I do you... follow uh, for, former economic finance minister Kudrin's tweets. He does a lot of tweeting, by the way, for those of you. And, and, uh, and, and he talks a great deal about the need for modernization. And Minister Reshkin, as a government representative, you also have a, a position that you are obliged I'm to represent. Not a, I'm not a government well, representative. Well, we know that you're, you are have recently not and that you, I suspect... You asked uh, me well, to be as frank as possible. Okay, so that's... I'm frank, I do my best. Thank you. you. <laughs> Mr. Sefcovich, you've been extremely patient. Um, I'm I'm uh, looking forward to, just wait, we will start impugning your bona fides in just a second and undermining your credibility. But before we do, let me ask you, um, uh, managing Europe's relationship with Russia at the moment must be incredibly difficult, given that there is no common European position on Russia. If you compare uh, the stance of, say, France, Germany, and Italy towards that of Poland and the Baltics, there's almost no common ground. So how can Europe come to a common position on Russia today, um, and what can Europe do collectively to improve its relationship with Russia, which in some areas at least is very negative and complicated? Of course, uh, our relationship over the last five years went through uh, very difficult uh, periods, and uh, I would say that uh, on most of the aspects uh, we have uh, really consensus. I mean, there is a consensus that uh, uh, we have to find the ways how to uh, move on and progress positively on the implementation on, on the means agreement. There is also uh, almost uh, no discussion if it comes uh, uh, to the debate on the, on the prolongation on sanctions. But at the same time, we in the European Union fully realize that Russia is global power, Russia forever will be uh, our neighbor. And uh, you ask me, uh, uh, and you thank me that I was a patient. Yes, I was, not only at this session, but I was a patient over the last five years. And I think in such a complex relationships like the EU-Russia uh, and Ukraine one, you just simply need to demonstrate diplomatic patience, which was actually key uh, to the fact that, that one channel, which was very important and which was open, meaning how to make sure that we would not have any more gas wars, that we would be able to actually 
actually find an agreement between Russia, Ukraine, and the European Union is such an important thing like the long-term gas uh, transit uh, through Ukraine for uh, Europe. Uh, it took us five years. Every single winter we had to find a solution. And of course, uh, in the end, uh, one day before the deadline, we find agreement for the next, I believe, uh, uh, 15 years of, of relationship uh, in a very important uh, uh, energy sector. What I want to say is that uh, from my point of view, that represents kind of glimpse of, glimpse of hope that we can use that pattern to tackle other critical issues in uh, European, Russian, Ukrainian relationship because it's very much intertwined. And what we did was that we've been looking at uh, different parts of, of that problem. We as Europeans, and it was me personally with my colleagues, we played the role of honest broker. They had a big support, uh, uh, not only from the leadership of the Commission, but also from Chancellor Merkel to, to have that uh, uh, political input given when it was necessary, for example, in different Normandy talks. And then we've been there to offer technical solutions, to offer compromise in text, and to, uh, to kind of be with both sides uh, in the name of achieving the agreement. And this is what we, this is what we achieved. And I think that now it's a, it's a, it's a time. Uh, to really invest more of a diplomatic patience, more of a positive uh, um, involvement and more diplomatic efforts uh, to achieve progress on the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. I, I'm optimistic that it could happen because I saw that dynamics in the room has changed. I was there with the previous Ukrainian uh, government. I'm in the room uh, with, the, with the new Ukrainian government. And the thing that atmosphere is different, that the ministers talk to each other, that the presidents call to each other, that we are able to find such a answers to such a difficult questions like the exchange uh, of prisoners, like ceasefire, but also very practical and multi-billion dollars questions, like the gas transit for the next five to 15 years. It just, it just proves that there is a possibility how to talk to each other and, and how to be constructive, uh, creative, and at the same time to have uh, uh, the, the positions which you can present well back home, be it in Kiev, in Moscow. And that, I think, is uh, uh, kind of my, my <laughs> recipe and my lesson after spending five years in these very tense negotiations with, the, with, the, with the both parties for the, for the future. And I think all of us would benefit from that. Because, I mean, look what's happening in Libya. What's, what's, happening in, uh, what's happening in Syria. This is our, this is our neighborhood, and I, I know that uh, um, our American friends maybe look at it from, a little bit from the distance, but for us it's very, very, very close. With all the consequences we have seen a uh, few years ago uh, resulting in a dramatic destabilization of our neighborhood and migration pressures. And again, if you want to resolve the situation as it was attempted now in Berlin, it was good that the Russian president was there. It was good that the Chancellor could invite all of them, that, uh, uh, that we had the diplomatic effort to resolve the issue which is extremely important for the European security. So I'm by profession diplomat. I like to talk. I like to negotiate, I like to find, uh, the, uh, to look for the, for, uh, for the solutions. And I think that now it's a time, because I believe that there is a new quality uh, of management, of government uh, in, in, in Ukraine. And, uh, and I believe that also that crucial and super intense talk. I can tell you that last month of December, every single day I spent a couple of hours talking to the, both parties. And I can say that the atmosphere was positive. It was difficult, technical, complicated. Uh, politically uh, very, very, very sensitive, but we found a solution. So I believe that if we put good faith in it, lots of effort, focus on the problems which are solvable, then uh, proceed with gradual build-up of confidence and trust that we can, I think, proceed to, to further steps uh, how to resolve these big issues which are dramatically complicated, uh, of course, the relationship between Europe and, uh, and Russia, but also between Russia and the United States, and of course, uh, um, uh, have a direct impact on the situation in our neighborhood. Thank you. But, but, uh, I'm going to get to the U.S. relationship in a minute. Mr. Dmitriev, you wanted yeah. to speak. I wanted to comment on this. I think this is a very healthy, positive perspective. And going back to the theme of the panel, which is outlook, strategic outlook for Russia, I'd like to just map out some of the ideas. So one of the ideas is that Russia, of course, wants to be a close partner of Europe. Our estimate is that from sanctions, Russia lost around $50 billion. Our estimate is that Europe lost around $240 billion. And we are talking to German business, Italian business, French business, and we believe that sanctions are negative. Uh, and we believe that, by the way, thanks to more flexible position of Ukraine, uh, 
And we agree with you that uh, President Zelensky is trying to build uh, good relations with Russia, and that's important, and we value that. That creates an opening to solve, hopefully this year, uh, the Ukrainian issue and move forward to a better relationship with Europe. He's speaking right now, by the way, Mr. Zelensky, so we'll see if you we'll still feel that better than yeah. the talk. Yeah. Uh, a second point, we need to recognize Russian geopolitical successes. Russia has really strengthened in the Middle East. It was very obvious in Berlin, recently in the Libya a peace conference, where Russia's views are thought out, and frankly, we play a big role in the region. And that has to be recognized. We brought stability uh, to Syria as well. And going back to uh, uh, Paula's uh, um, uh, points, I think, by the way, we need people like her in the U.S. who study Russia deeply, because lots of analysis in the U.S. is very shallow. And frankly, the shallow analysis almost makes Russians think is that U.S. doesn't want Russia to grow economically, doesn't want Russia to succeed, and basically wants to undermine Russia. And I think we need to move to deep analysis that basically says, no, U.S. wants Russia to be uh, successful. U.S. wants Russia to grow 3, 4, 5 percent uh, a year. And we have lots of things that we can do jointly with the U.S., from fighting terrorism to, uh, you know, ensuring no uh, weapons of mass distractions get disseminated, etc. So my strategic overview for Russia is quite positive. We have achieved great geopolitical successes. We have good macroeconomy. We had good some results that many American friends don't know, such as our stock market grew 55% last year. Our foreign direct investment doubled last year. But definitely, I agree with you that there is lots needs to happen. Modernization, uh, reforms, making sure growth happens. Uh, and this is where the effort should be. And uh, this is where new government and lots of young people will take Russia forward. I'm going to stop you there. I'm sorry, but we have very little time and we need to move on. Ambassador Dobryansky, how will uh, the U.S. relationship with Russia change if a Democrat is elected this year? Uh, if a Democrat is elected this year, uh, I think that I would actually, and it might surprise people, say, I think whether there's been a, a Democrat in the White House or a Republican in the White House, I think that consistently there's always been a desire to have a strong and constructive relationship with Russia. In fact, when I go back and I look at the various presidents right up to President Trump, each in their own way, President George W. Bush, remember, reached out to President Putin in, in the way in which he did personally. Then President Obama, you had the reset. And then, no less, President Trump has talked very extensively about the importance of the relationship. But having said that, there's that strong desire, but I think there's also a recognition of what is happening on the ground. And now I'm not speaking of the domestic part, but I am speaking of the foreign policy part, of what is a perception and the belief of what would constitute foreign policy adventurism, where there are steps undertaken by Russia which are impacting others, encroaching on the sovereignty of Ukraine. I couldn't agree more with what you said about that need to reconcile and to resolve that situation so that Ukraine can have its own territory back and its sovereignty in this case. In the case of Syria, in terms of what happens, and let me also even mention Turkey, that whole region, the selling of arms, Venezuela, Russia's investment in Venezuela, as we know. So I think that there's a political dimension that also has an impact on how our presidents, and including a uh, forthcoming, if there is a Democratic president, although I will say I think that Trump is going to win. Okay, we have about 14 <laughs> minutes left. Uh, I'd like to... <laughs> I'm just going to gloss over that um, and take questions from the audience, please. We should have microphones floating around, so just raise... Yep, we do. Any questions? If not, uh, we are happy to keep talking. Um, Mm, yes, gentlemen in the second row. Just wait for the mic, please, and when you get it, uh, start by telling us who you are, please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bill Browder, um, CEO of Hermitage Capital Management. Um, my question is, is for the uh, uh, representative of the government here. Um, you, you've uh, painted a rosy picture and an optimistic future for Russia. Um, I have a bit of a different experience. I, I was once the largest... A public equity investor in Russia, 
Uh, I uncovered massive corruption in state-owned companies, Gazprom, Spare Bank, Unified Energy Systems. I exposed it. In retaliation, I was expelled from the country. Um, my offices were raided. My lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky, was arrested, tortured, and killed. And his murder was covered up. And I continue to be pursued by your government right up until today here in Davos. Um, the largest private equity investor was Mike Calvi. Um, he was a different guy than, than me. He didn't protest about corruption. He didn't try to expose bad things in Russia. He said all good things. He was arrested just about a year ago. Uh, he's under house arrest with all of his staff. The entire law enforcement establishment of your country is involved in criminal activity extorting people. How can you possibly say that there's going to be an optimistic future for Russia with that type of thing going on? It will happen. Russia's future is definitely positive, Bill. Can you say more about how those kinds of issues will be addressed? Well, I was not at the government at that point of time, so I have no information about that. It was very old days. Nonetheless, the, there was a widely documented uh, attitude, uh, an environment of criminality um, that uh, uh, is and will prevent Russia from growing and will scare off foreign investment. What kind of measures have been taken well, to address you know, this? Like Kirill just said, you just need to look at the figures. There is multi dozen billions of inflows of investments in the stock market, in the bond market. This is the answer to the question. No, that's an explanation. I mean, that's, that suggests that things have changed, but it doesn't tell us how things are changed or why they've changed. Well, it's the, if there is the positive trend in investment in flow, it means that everything it, goes well. Right. But what I'm asking is what kind of changes have been made to prevent abuses like that from occurring? Well, first of all, there is uh, what Bill said. It's his point of view. There are different points of view on this issue. Like it was said that uh, we like different points of view. So it's not, uh, you know, it's a you know, very, this very This is not just a fairy tale, and big though. Story. It's been extensively uh, uh, reported a, well, and report, documented. Once again, you, 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 you even may say it was tweeted, uh, something like that. It was not reported. There are different views on this story. They're totally different. Me personally, I don't know who is right. But reality is that, that more money is coming into Russia. And those people definitely can count money and understand what is moving in the positive direction and what is moving into the negative direction. That's John, the answer. Jonathan, may I add a footnote? The question was directed by Mr. Browder to our Russian colleagues, but I will mention he raises several important points about the issue of corruption, and even you earlier, Jonathan, raised that, why that wasn't part of the discourse. Corruption is a key factor, and what does that relate to? That really relates to if businesses are going to invest, there's an issue of transparency. There's an issue of not just having rule of law, but having a functioning independent judiciary and a protection of businesses and business investment. So again, it goes back to what's the kind of atmosphere and how it's conducive or not conducive. And I think that uh, Mr. Browder gave not only his own specific case, but the other case. Uh, there are other cases in this case. And it goes back to where does Russia want to go? And I would say that those who have described this issue of modernization and I'm now speaking of not Americans. I want to go back to the Russians who are talking about this. They want to have an investment in the country and grow the country and make sure that there is such a solid economic foundation that actually that really ensures that it's open, it's transparent, and it is extremely competitive because that's not the direction at all that it's moving in. And if this is not an issue that's addressed, it's going to be unfortunate for future investment in the country. Let me touch uh, on some of this. I'm actually uh, going to go to a very interesting session tomorrow by Professor Schiller, and it's about narratives. And he is a Nobel Prize winner, and basically he talks about how narratives shape economics. And it seems a very simplistic idea how storytelling you know, shapes people's minds. Uh, and I think the story that we hear from some people here that, you know, Russia is just very difficult and black and no hope is just not correct. Uh, 
Uh, and Bill knows, for example, that you know, I manage government fund. I was one of the first ones to say that we support Bayern Vostok. We believe they are the best uh, investor in Russia. Since that, we, I personally vouch for Mr. Calvi. We co-invested with Bayern Vostok and today actually announced that we are open to be one of the limited partners in the future fund with some of our partners. So Russia consists of different views, different opinions, and it really needs to be supported and not just put in this very negative narrative box of no hope. Because, uh, well, Bill, you are here every year, and we hear you every year. So please let me respond. I, I, feel, I feel your points. Please uh, hear my point about narratives. <laughs> so uh, the narratives really have to include realistic facts about Russia. And it has to be very, you know, uh, not shaped also. And sorry, I'll be very direct. You know, there are some uh, Baltic countries and other uh, Eastern European countries who are just afraid of Russia and have this narrative in the European Union of Russia being aggressive toward them and, frankly, shaping the narrative through that. And Russia is not aggressive to Baltic nations. Russia is not aggressive to, you know, small countries of Eastern Europe. So, frankly, I think Davos is a good uh, platform to have an honest narrative uh, and have different perspectives, but narrative is not as bleak as we hear from some of our American friends. But, Mr. Dmitriev, because you raised it, I have to ask, I mean, do you deny that Mr. Calvi is under house arrest in, in prison? Do you deny that Magnitsky died uh, after being abused in prison? Okay, well, first of all, I think as a moderator, you have to be slightly more balanced <laughs> and hear what I am saying. And what I am saying... Is that, uh, is that I personally, you know, am very supportive of Bayern Vostok. I have done lots of things to solve this case. Mm -hmm. And it goes through Russian judicial system, right. and we hope for a positive resolu resolution of this case. So rather than putting Russia in this black box, just, you know, you need to really recognize some of the positive things that are happening. And the positive things that are happening is that, you know, okay, he is not in jail, he is under house arrest, that's an improvement, and we hope for a positive resolution of this case. Okay, fair enough. Uh, 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 no, excuse me, excuse me, I'm, I'm, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, I'll give you a second to respond, um, but because I was addressed directly, I am a moderator, I am also a journalist, and a journalist's job is to uncover the facts. Now, narratives are very important as well, but we also need to establish objective reality insofar as it is possible, and when objective facts get, which are well documented and well reported seem to get glossed over, they need to be raised and addressed. And yeah. that's simply Not what I was doing. objective fact. Great. Please. You know, in order to get the objective reality, like we said in the beginning, you should simply come to Russia <laughs> just to see how it looks in reality. Right here. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Jürgen Katainen, uh, currently president of the Finnish Innovation Fund. I used to be Mr. Sefikujic's um, uh, colleague, vice president of commission. I'm former Prime Minister of Finland. I just uh, want to look at the long-term future and strategic interest of Europe and, and Russia. And one of the ideas, which is, um, in my mind, low-hanging fruit, is to open up Russian universities to the rest of the world. This is what universities you normally do, but uh, to a lesser extent in, in Russia. Also, the student exchange is what happens everywhere, but uh, the lesser extent between the EU and, and Russia. So it's, it's not politically sensitive at all, and it, what ha, it's what's happening everywhere in the world. And it's the way to modernize uh, the science, but also to create better innovation environment to Russia, but also use Russian expertise in, in the EU. So I'm sorry, can you be more specific? What is not happening that should be happening with a, Russian universities? A student exchange between let's say, European universities and, and Russian universities, to the extent what is happening, for instance, between EU and American or EU and African even mm -hmm. universities. And the second thing is that the, the, the Russian uh, universities are not internationally that open as the peers are. But, but this is, I, I is, say this is, in positive. It depends on the university. Excuse yeah, me, is there, is there a question there? No, there, uh, there was just an idea Proposal. how to, to, to look at the, the strategic uh, growth story in sure. the long term. I have, a, I have a quick, I want to come back to a point I made because the comments made about data. 
So uh, I said former foreign uh, finance minister Kudrin. He now is the accounts manager. That's an official government position. Okay, I underscore that. That's, that's a fact. A, that's a fact. <laughs> exactly. He's right. So to be clear about it, he actually, he's on the record, he tracks budgets. And I said this point before, which coincides with your point. I just want to underscore it, that the, for the last five, six years, he mentioned when you evaluate where the monies are going, they're invested in defense and security. And that in terms of investment in human capital, the budget has not gone towards education and towards human capital. And in this case, really looking at creative solutions. Those are his words. I want to be clear on the narrative, not a Western perspective on that, which I'm sharing with you because, to me, it caught my attention but, in no. terms of the idea and the fact that this kind of perspective is being discussed internally. And your phrase is just showing that you are simply not working with figures. If you open the fiscal statistics and look at the spending on the defense, you will find that in the past couple of years it went down by one percentage point of GDP. And you are referring to comments Mr. Kudrin was doing, I believe, two or three years ago, and not now, because there is the big difference that happened. So please, look at the figures, look at the facts, talk to the people. These are exactly then, from the figures. And then, and then okay. make a suggestion. Well, you know, I know, I know figures very well, because I work with them <laughs> on an everyday basis. And if you look at this spending on the defense, it decreased substantially. You can just check when you'll be back. That could just be the check. case. I won't dispute that. But his point, and let me move that aside, was that it's not invested in education. Well, because it, 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 because it was it, because we have, a, a we fiscal have, adjustment period. We know? have two minutes left. <laughs> um, we have uh, uh, no way of verifying whose facts or, and data are correct because we're not going to start Googling things while we're up on the dais. Um, and let's not spend uh, our last two minutes about arguing um, uh, who has the best information at their fingertips. Mr. Dmitriev, I want to come back to you because you, you asked, you raised a topic before that you, you didn't really address. You said that Russia wants to improve uh, its relations with Europe. And then you went on to catalog a long list of Russia's accomplishments. But you didn't actually say how Russia can improve its relationships with Europe and what it could do constructively to make the relationship better than it is today. Well, I think it's very clear that with U.S. and China really having a significant, um, you know, conflict issues, short-term resolve, but long-term some issues, there is a very strong case for Europe and Russia being together as a strong economic uh, power, a third power that is uh, strong and united and working together. We have always had Germany as our number one trading partner. Now China uh, took over that position. But again, Russia has been consistent uh, on willing to have great relationships with Europe. We are co-investing with many Europeans, with Orpia into, um, you know, different things, etc., etc. So again, that's another very important narrative. Russia is not a hostile power who wants to hurt Europe. Everybody here from the Russian audience knows Russia wants to be a partner with Europe, wants to improve relationship with the U.S. I think we now have a very constructive process with the Ukraine to solve uh, the issues. And again, Russia has a potential to be jointly with Europe. You know, we have the same from Lisbon to Vladivostok as a joint strong economic actor. So I'm afraid we are out of time. I think we'll all agree this has been a fascinating conversation. Among other things, we've learned that the debate over truth, um, the post-truth environment, um, uh, and what is false news, fake news, and what is not, is no longer limited to Washington, but has moved to Davos as well. Um, please join me in thanking our guests, uh, and thank you all for attending.